running. Well, after about um, 30 seconds in this uh, dark corner, I uh, pulled myself together and uh, I returned to the American lady and the Italian and she caught hold of my arm, we caught hold of my arm, and we walked around Michelangelo's David. As I remember it, around the base and round about were legends in Italian, German, Russian, Spanish, and English. I don't read any other language other than English, so my eyes uh, lit upon one in English which said, Michelangelo said, it's very simple. All you do is knock off what you don't want and leave on what you do. And my hair stood on end. After all those years, the full impact of what my grandfather had told me, my great-grandfather said to him, hit me. Because my great-grandfather was a peasant. I don't see, I can't imagine how he could have heard of Michelangelo. I can't remotely imagine how he could have known anything that he said or wrote. The extraordinary thing is that these two men doing, in a way, the same job, thought and articulated precisely in the same manner. And I can't think of anything any comment about creative work that is more simple, more pure than this. Speaking as an actor, it is of more use to me, and I imagine to my colleagues if they digested it, it is more use to me and all other actors than the entire works of Stanislavski put together. It's very simple. All you do is knock off what you don't want and leave on what you do. Very simple, but immeasurably difficult. I was, um, I was invalided out of the Air Force while the war was still on. While in the Air Force, like so many servicemen, I hitchhiked a great deal, though, uh, like most other things in my life, I did that to excess. Uh, for instance, once the Air Force took me to the United States of America and I managed to acquire sufficient leave to hitchhike between 14 and 15,000 miles. Uh, but here I was now, out of the Air Force, with the war still on, and I still had this inclination to hitchhike. I, uh, at that time, had a home in Stratford-on-Avon. On this particular occasion that I'd like to tell you about, um, I was hitchhiking from London to Stratford-on-Avon, and uh, I got as far as Oxford. I got on the Oxford Bypass, and finally got to the road that leads to Stratford-on-Avon over the Cotswolds. But it was very late at night, and uh, I wasn't getting a lift. Uh, it got to about one o'clock in the morning, which for hitchhikers is a very critical period. People uh, don't like to pick you up at one o'clock in the morning, so much as one o'clock in the afternoon. And of course there aren't so many cars. I was contemplating looking for a haystack to uh, kip down in, which I very often did in the old days, and uh, never really worried about it, didn't worry too much about the rats, um, when suddenly along came, um, I think it was, a small old Austin 7, as I remember it, can't be specific, and in it was a gentleman who, it now strikes me, was very large, and he had a bowler hat on, I think, but this is the general impression I got, and he leaned forward, opened the door, and said, uh, get in. Well, I got in, and uh, I always felt about hitchhiking that it was a sort of responsibility um, for the person who had been given a lift to uh, contribute something in the way, if he had anything interesting to say, try and start conversation, if he could make a contribution. And by and large, of course, people who, this is the charming thing about hitchhiking, the people who give you lifts tend to be more sociable than those who don't, so your chances of an interesting conversation are greater than normal. Well, I, I, I tried my luck with this gentleman, but he wasn't very communicative, he just was rather, he turned out, as a matter of fact, to be, as he told me, an insurance collector in the Cotswolds, and he just uh, drove on with his bowler hat, and uh, 
and wasn't very forthcoming. I started one or two, well, then perhaps the best thing you can do is to be quiet, but I tried one other thing, rather sort of footling conversation. I, I got onto music and said uh, how much I wished I'd played an instrument, and then said, well, you know, that's ridiculous. If I wanted to play an instrument, I'd learn to play one, you know. People are very tiresome who say they'd like to play an instrument and uh, have never had the application or sat down to learn. Didn't go down too well. There was a long pause and silence. And then finally, driving along, he was. He said, uh, I'll play the piano. So I said, oh, do you really? I said, well, there you are. You said, uh, I said, I talk about it and you just play. He said, yeah. He said, well, I'll play a bit, you know. He said, uh, yeah. Hmm. Matter of fact, he said, I, uh, I have accompanied uh, a gili. So I looked at him and I thought, well, you know, there must be a... But I couldn't let it go, so I said, Gili, I said, you mean, uh, you know, the, the, the Italian singer? He said, yeah, he said, you know, the uh, Beniamino Gili, yes, uh, great, uh, so they say, great, great singer, yes, I have played the piano. I said, well, that's extraordinary, really, I said, but some people say that this man has the greatest voice in the world today. You, he said, yeah, yeah well, uh, he said, well, it happened like this, he said, as a matter of fact, he said, I, uh, I was with the 8th Army, he said, but I, I got a packet and uh, I was invalided out and, uh, um, you know, he said, uh, and uh, he said, with the 8th Army, I said, well, as a matter of fact, I said, I was in the Air Force and I caught a sort of packet and I got invalided, oh, he said, yeah, so I said, he said, well, you see, he said, I was with the 8th Army and we finished in the Middle East in the desert and then, uh, he said, um, we did the advance to Italy and, uh, Finally, he said, it was pretty tough going, and one evening in a naffy or a canteen or something, he said, I was there with the lads, he said, and I was playing on the old Joanna, you know, he said, in the canteen, and a uh, sergeant came in and said, uh, he said, uh, Smith, well, I, I don't remember what his name was, he said, Smith, he said, uh, he said, look, he said, uh, he said, uh, look, he said, we want you to uh, play the piano for us, we've got a job for you. And I said, oh, yes, Sergeant. I said, what is it? And he said, uh, well, he said, look, he, I'll, I'll be perfectly frank. He said, we, it so happens that we've just bypassed the home of uh, distinguished, very great singer, Benjamin O'Shealy. And uh, he's very kindly consented, uh, told the CO that he'll uh, sing to the lads. And uh, the CO's told me to find someone who plays the Joanna, and you're the one who does it every night, so uh, you're on. So, uh, bloke driving. He said, well, he said, you see, he said, the trouble, I said, the sergeant, I said, well, look, I, uh, you see, the trouble is, sergeant, I, I can't play those sort of, uh, those sort of songs, you know, I mean, I just knock out the popular stuff for the lads, and, uh, you know, that isn't up my street, really. He said, now, look, Smith, he says, every night I see you here, he said, you're playing the whole bleed in evening. He said, now, look, he said, don't argue with me, the seer's in there, he has a gentleman with him, and you're going to whip in right. So, he said, he took me in, well, I hadn't exchanged, he said, oh, there was the CO, and I really hadn't exchanged a word with him before. But there he was, and he said, uh, Smith, he said, um, I understand that you play the piano, and uh, I think Sergeant's explained to you that um, um, we have here in the next room a uh, very great singer, Benjamin Gilly, who has consented to sing to the troops. And uh, we'd like you to play the piano for him. He wants a British soldier to play the piano while he... I said, well, look, sir, I said, the, you know, the thing is that I don't, you know, you know, I don't read music. He said, now, look, uh, Smith, it's a bit of an emergency, and uh, um, uh, the gentleman's here, and he's going to sing tonight, and we want you to knuckle under now, and, you know, pull to and do it. So, uh, he said, no, don't argue, Smith. So, the gentleman went out and brought in, so this gentleman said, Benjamin Gili, and he said the Italian gentleman came in, and, uh, and uh, he said, uh, I said, uh, you will play the piano for me. And I said, uh, well, look, the thing is, uh, the trouble is, you see, the CEO and the sergeant don't seem to understand, but uh, uh, I don't read music, you see. I just vamp it off, you know. I play by ear, and, uh, and you know, they don't seem to understand this. So uh, um, the Italian gentleman, he said, he said, Gili, he said, uh, right. He said, now, don't you worry. He said, I will solve this. He said, tell me. Uh, Mr. Smith. He said, do you know the song, Come Back to Sorrento? And well, I knew the tune, so uh, I had to admit. I said, yes. I said, yes. He said, ah, good, good. He said, do you know and name some, uh, you know, Neapolitan airs, popular ones? And I knew them, like Come Back to Sorrento. And I said, yeah. He said, good. He said, Mr. Smith, he said, no. He said, you, he said, you play Come Back to Sorrento on the piano, and I will follow you. So, he said, I did it. <laughs>
He said, I sat there in front of two or three thousand of the lads and uh, driving through the Cotswolds, you know. And uh, he said, I played it in front of two or three thousand of the lads. I just played it as I know. And uh, Benjamino Gili sang, come back to Sorrento and the other tunes I knew. He followed and there was nothing went wrong and two or three thousand of the lads, you know, were very pleased about it. Well, at that moment, he said, well, uh, I'm turning off the left here, you know, I've got to go down into the Cotswolds. And uh, he said, I said, well, thank you very much indeed. And I got out, and I spent the night in a hayrick, but it was well worth it, well worth it. Running. When I was a little boy, I was about seven years old. I know I was about seven years old because of the house that I was living in, which I left when I was eight, and it certainly wasn't just before we left. I lived in this house with my uh, grandfather and grandmother, who were, to all intents and purposes, my mother and father. They brought me up. This story started in my grandfather's vegetable garden in Tenby in Pembrokeshire. And there I was on a summer's evening with my grandfather, just the two of us. He'd finished work in his vegetable garden and I was with him. He'd sat down on a mound of earth and I was looking at the garden. It's important that you know that I was only seven years old because of the sort of conversation that we had extraordinary conversation really for a little boy and uh, and a grandfather to have well I looked at this garden which was pretty perfect and I wonder why it was such a good garden because of this sandy soil in Tenby it's like sand but things grew in it beautifully marvelously and I looked at this remarkable garden it was so perfect so neat and I turned to my grandfather and I said, I called him Grampy. And I said, Grampy, I said, your garden's very pretty. It's very perfect. It's very neat, whatever words I used when I was seven, but those are the sentiments. And he said, I'm very glad you think so, Ken. He said, and it reminds me of a time a long while ago when I said very nearly the same thing to my father, your great-grandfather. He said because his garden, if you think that mine is pretty and perfect, you should have seen his. His was perfect. Immaculate is the word I would use now. That is the intention that he wished to uh, communicate to me. He said, but as you know, and as I've told you, he had a terrible temper. So much so that I was very frightened of my father. I, ever, I hardly ever dared speak to him. He said, even when I was a young man, he told me, and I was just a little boy, he said, even when I was a young married man, I still kept my garden as neat as this, as perfect as this. But even when I was a young married man, I was afraid for my father, your great-grandfather, to see it because he'd find it so unsatisfactory, or whatever the words my grandfather would have used to me, that he would lose his temper with me, and I was frightened of him, even when I was a young married man. He said, but, when I was your age, and we lived at the square, now the square is the little cottage where my grandfather was born, and my great-grandfather lived, and it was called the square because before they lived there, it was a little village pub, or it wasn't even a village, it was in the depth of the country, but it was a pub called The Square, and uh, they kept on the name when they lived there, and it still stands to this day. About 18 months ago, I went back, and though it was empty, I had a look in it, and it's still known as The Square. He said, one evening, one summer's evening at The Square, I was standing in my father's garden, and he had finished work in it, as I finished work here, but he, as was his custom, he had gone up past the square when he'd finished work, up into the meadow above the cottage, and at the top of the meadow he had 
a large slab of hard stone. He was, incidentally, a stonemason, as my grandfather was a stonemason, and as sometimes I think I should have been a stonemason. I come from a long line of stonemasons, with one eccentric uh, deviation, which is another story, a very interesting story, but I won't start now. So, there he was, at the top of the meadow, with his hammer and chisel, sitting in front of this hard piece of stone. I looked, my grandfather said, at this perfect garden, and I thought what you have just thought about my garden, how wonderful it was. He said, but this really was wonderful. He said, it seemed that every grain of earth had to be perfect, perfect. Every vegetable had to be in a strict line. The vegetables were a perfect shape. Everything was perfect and beautiful. But, having thought that, I looked up at my father in the meadow, and I thought that I would like to get as close to him as I dared and he was talking about his father, and look at what he is doing. So, I uh, walked past the cottage, past the square, and I got to the top of the meadow. I didn't get very close, but I stood and I watched him. And he was, as was his custom, cutting with his hammer and chisel out of hard stone a flower. He carved flowers out of hard stone of a summer's evening when he'd finished work. And I stood and watched him for a long time. He didn't say anything to me, so I stayed. And since he didn't say anything to me, my grandfather said, I at last found the courage to speak to my father. And I said something that I'd wanted to say for a long time. I said, Father, that must be very difficult to carve a flower out of hard stone. He said, my father didn't say anything. He didn't look at me. But after a moment, he put down his hammer and he put down his chisel and then looked at me and said, no, Annie, it's very simple. All you do is knock off what you don't want and leave on what you do. Picked up his hammer, picked up his chisel, and continued. Now that story has stayed with me for, what's it, 25 years, I'm not sure of figures, but a long time. I remember the story. It was an important story to me, but its full impact didn't hit me till about five years ago, something like that, five years ago, when I went off to Italy on a sort of romantic adventure with a delightful and splendid young American lady. Finally, we ended up at Florence, in Florence, and what we both wanted to see most of all was what is said to be Michelangelo's greatest work. David. David, the great stone figure of David, which lives in Florence. And so, we went to the museum, the art gallery, where Michelangelo's David lives, is kept. And we had with us an Italian acquaintance who spoke English, and the young American lady held onto my arm, and we walked down a sort of avenue of Michelangelo figures, as I remember it. Famous figures that he'd been commissioned to carve for the Vatican. Uh, they're strange figures, wonderful figures. They, some say they're not completed. Perhaps Michelangelo didn't intend them to be completed because they're just great blocks, blocks of stone, and unfinished. And out of them seem to be struggling human figures, as if they're trying to, living figures, trying to escape from the living stone, as it were. Terrifying, wonderful figures. But, right at the end, as I see it, as my memory serves me, there at the end was this fantastic creation, Michelangelo's David. Wonderful. And I heard the Italian say, out of the corner of my ear, I heard the Italian say, um, Michelangelo uh, acquired this piece of stone because it had been rejected as imperfect by another Florentine sculptor, and he made this David out of this piece of rejected stone at the age of 21. Well, 
Uh, I don't mind now, you know, five years or five years. For some reason, I don't mind people seeing me cry now. But five years ago, I really didn't want that young American woman to see me cry. So I quietly, gently detached my arm, went into a relatively darkened corner, and I suppose I spent about 30 seconds there, stopped weeping, recovered, came back to her, and she took my arm and we walked round David. And there, all around David, were legends in English, Spanish, German, French, Italian. I don't speak, read any of these languages, but there was one in English. And the one in English said, Michelangelo said, it's very simple. All you do is knock off what you don't want and leave on what you do. My hair stood on end and the impact hit me. Because, you see, the extraordinary thing is that my grandfather, my great-grandfather, was a peasant. I can't see how he could possibly have heard of Michelangelo, leave alone known what he wrote or said. But the extraordinary thing is, you see, that both these men, doing the same sort of job, in a way, thought precisely alike. And as far as I am able to ascertain, as far as I am able to imagine, there is no statement about creative work more perfect.